morning's sermon text is 2 Timothy 2.21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified in meat for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Our dear Heavenly Father, I pray for Brother Gene as he comes up to share the message that he has prepared for us, and that we would get very much out of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear brethren, so good to see all of you, many whom we've had close associations for a, a score of years or more, others whom we've met recently or in the recent, more recent past, and we joy and rejoice in your presence and in our assembly here and the opportunity we have to give ourselves to these good things, uh, to apply ourselves to these themes, uh, to recount, recall, rehearse the things that God has worked among us, uh, precious things, everlasting things. We're not dealing with, with uh, matters of systems or methodology here unless you consider, unless you want to lay those labels to God's eternal purpose. Ultimately, what we, as Brother Jason so aptly said, what we uh, focus upon in this gathering and extended assembly is the eternal purpose of God. And this particular application of it, sanctification. It seems in reconsidering this theme and this word, this particular term that we use, sanctification, that's not something that you hear in, in common everyday language. Once, once in a while you might hear some educated person use the term and, and they, would, they would use it uh, in, in the sense that we also mean it, an exclusivity, uh, a focus, an emphasis, a commitment in that sense. Whether you're talking about an athlete or a, a, a business person and their, uh, their adherence to their business plan, and uh, the interests of their business, the interests of their customers, the interests of their employees. Uh, that's the sense in which the word is used when you hear it in uh, everyday common vernacular today. But the scripture uses it in connection with God's working in his people and its connection to his eternal purpose, with the glory of his name, and to honor his uh, workings, his words, his doings uh, that he has asserted, that, he ha that, that God has imposed upon the human race down through the ages. The scriptures, of course, are a record of those things, of the imposition of God's will upon the earth. Uh, our assemblies are the only ones that I know of, hopefully there are other places, but only ones that I know of who, who recognize uh, that God does such a thing. Uh, we here in the American culture are used to thinking uh, about our liberty and that all things are of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that's affected a lot of religious thinking, a lot of church thinking. You hear things like that in a lot of sermons nowadays, as, as if God adheres to the American Constitution in some sense, and that God is interested in making sure that we have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he's going to intervene in the political parties and so forth and so on. Well, he can do that, but he won't do it according to our agenda. You can be sure of that. And so as we consider these things uh, during our assembly these three days, uh, we want to keep that in mind, that what we focus on and emphasize here is God's agenda, his purpose, and his will to affirm and enact that purpose. Brother Paul, of course, it seems to me anyway, is, is the primary uh, source, human source, by which we know these things. Now, the Moses and the Psalms and the prophets testified of it. They speak of it. Uh, in, in general terms, in shadow language, if you want to say it that way. Uh, but it's through Brother Paul, primarily. 
where we hear this fleshed out, if you will. Now, I don't mean that. I don't mean that according to the world, of course. But he, he gives us the practical sense of it, how these things work, how God works these things in his people by the administration of his grace that teaches us, by the Spirit under the shepherding oversight of his dear Son. Again, this text, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctify, meet for the master's use, and prepared under every good work. Now, God's Spirit granted Brother Paul a number, as I, as I say this, I know that many of these texts may come to your mind, a number of, of striking written summaries of his great redemption, where in just a few words, maybe two dozen words, he compresses these great works into, into a statement or two. They were, they were, at once, they were enlightening reports, challenging exhortations, and cautionary admonitions or warnings. Let me give you one here that comes from the first part of this letter. Now, we understand this is Brother Paul's final letter to Brother Timothy. What we call verses 7 through 10 of the first chapter. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who hath saved us and call us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now there's about 40 or 50 sermons in that statement, isn't there? Yeah. You could pick that apart two or three words at a time, preach a sermon from each one of those. Now with these themes in mind, the themes that Brother Paul enumerates here, our focus text is a conclusion that Brother Paul, Brother Paul draws from his thoughts that include warning Brother Timothy and encouraging him about faithfulness in persecution faithfulness in hardships and endurance, faithfulness in handling the scripture, and faithfulness in dealing with unbelieving men. Now that's a, that's a truckload, isn't it? That's a large undertaking that can be done only by the power of God's spirit and the grace and truth that are in Christ Jesus. My brethren, we know that the provision of God's grace and truth is a primary work of our Savior that he's executing right now. He's doing these things right now. And, and, and we would that we ourselves be right in the mainstream of that work that he's doing now. He, he never rests from doing that. He need not rest. For he grows not weary, does he? <laughs> so we want to put forth the hands of our faith and enter into this effort of God's good and eternal purpose with everything that we have and everything that we do. Nothing, of course, nothing else will do, will it? But that we give ourselves wholly, totally, and only to these things. We, now, we can still be involved in other kinds of things, so to speak, ancillary things. That, that contribute to this. But this is our focus. This is, this is what consumes the all of us, even as we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after him. See, Brother Paul said, here, here's the way he put it, text that we're all familiar with, seek those things which are above. For Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, and then in another of his letters, he gives this warning. For to be carnally minded is death. 
but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's a pretty good perspective about sanctification, isn't it? Yielding yourself to that work. So, Brother Paul's words are calculated to provoke us through Brother Timothy as to our involvement with God's will, even the effects of his great salvation in us. Any supposed power of our own will in this matter is not sufficient. We already know that, don't we? Remember our past? It's not sufficient. Remember even our past religious efforts before things became clearer for us. It's not sufficient. And that's not even considering the greater, more powerful spiritual forces that are against us even now and would seek to derail us. So our only strength is in our Savior and his spirit dwelling in us. God's manner of fellowship is by his spirit. We participate in his goodness and wisdom through the faith of Christ Jesus. In these, via his truth, concerning him, Brother Paul warns and urges Timothy and us also to fully engage this provision. Moment by moment fellowship with the Savior is the arena of our involvement in these things. The means by which we take hold of, or the faith is the means by which we take hold of these things. So we give our attention to this gospel which purged us and keeps us as vessels then fit, holy vessels. He is our foundation. No other has been laid. He's not been replaced by any religious councils that you may have heard about making decisions lately that's been broadcast in the media and trumpeted in the media as being progressive and, and even evolutionary in their thinking. Huh? There is no other foundation that has been laid, and we will not be separated from him. We will not be. We will stand. And we will make the common, the common confession that others have made down through the generation, even signing it with their blood, haven't they? And others still do. There may be brethren right now who are signing it with their blood in other places in the earth as they themselves are sanctified by the working of these things. What Brother Paul's doing in this primary text, our focus text, that we're going to handle now is simply urging Brother Timothy himself. Now, he's a believer, okay? He has been set at a certain place in the body. He's been given a particular assignment, if you will, a particular commission. We Christian church folk like to hear that word once in a while, don't we? <laughs> commission. And that means it's a mission with God, a commission. See, it's his mission. We've been enrolled in it. We've been assigned a place in it. Just like in a military operation or an athletic team or, or uh, some kind of work schedule, some, some business that, that has 15 or 20 people, where everybody has their assignment, okay? Brother Timothy had his assignment. And we're reading about part of his mission description, if you will, okay? And it's a conclusion. He says many other things that lead to this point. Therefore, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the Father's, I'm sorry, for the Master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Therefore, purge yourself, he says, by the determinate strength of God's grace working in us. Now, we, we understand that God's grace is not just to save us and snatch us from the fire. Well, it does that. But that's just the beginning. That's just, that's just to get us in the, in the place where we need to be to move forward then in the straight and narrow way. And it's, it's grace that brings us in. It's grace that keeps us. It's grace that will finish us. The favor of God, if you will, that is in his son, Christ Jesus. It's calcul calculated to teach us as we walk in the light and the truth while his blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We're not talking about religious methodology here and proprietary matters of what's appropriate and this first and this second and this third. No, we're talking about a vital, living union, rooted and grounded in him who is the source of all good things pertaining to God. 
Jesus had and has now. God's grace without measure or limit. And he dispenses it to us, portions of what his father gives him. He dispenses it to us in our times of need. That is, as we walk by faith, as we walk in the spirit of godly wisdom and truth and righteousness that he's, that he's also made known to us, that he provides for us. And not according to the ways of the world, which opposes God's way. This world opposes God's ways, doesn't it? Those who walk in those ways of the world cannot, cannot assume upon God's grace to sustain them. It will not. It is calculated to sustain those who've received the love of the truth. So it's the determinate strength of God's grace that works these things in us. It's also the testimony of his truth. Scripture's a written word, written record, I'm sorry, written record. This lamp to our feet and light to our path multitudes of prior generations. The scripture calls it, the spirit calls it a great cloud of witnesses. Walked in this light as it grew brighter and brighter through the ages. Well, there were some of them that had nothing but starlight. Others had more moonlight as we in this part of the country had a uh, last Friday and Saturday evenings had a great full moon, bright as can be so bright it frightened our little two and a half year old grandson when I took him outside to see it. <laughs> he didn't want to go out there and see that anymore. Some had more light. Paul reminds Timothy that it makes this written scripture makes one wise into salvation. For instance, Brother Job, Brother Abraham, Brother Joseph, I had no written record of these things. Brother David did, didn't he? Brother Jeremiah did. They could turn to the writings of Moses. And Jeremiah could turn to the writings of David. And what little bit there was from Solomon. Solomon didn't see very much, of course, outside of what he could touch and taste and feel. So there was more and more. And his content is not academic or intellectual only. These things that God has made known, the testimony of the truth, feeds the heart and soul and mind of the believer, works in us that which nothing else can work. The saints of old walked in the starlight, as I said, in moonlight. We now walk in the light of the sunrise from on high, by comparison. You can hardly overestimate the critical nature of the scripture in the sanctification of God's saints. And Brother Paul's touching on these things. See, the grace of God in, in previous statements that he's made in this letter, this particular letter, the grace of God, the testimony of the truth, the endurance of hardness, he reminds Timothy, the endurance of hardness, which is a reasonable part of living by faith and abiding in the earth, which is hostile to God and his ways. And also, our bodies have a law in them that's against us, doesn't it? In but Paul's letter to Rome, he reminded them that he, he, he expounded that for them, for their understanding. But we also have in us the law of the spirit of life in our hearts and minds. The former laws in the body inclines us to here and now only. But this law of the spirit of life draws us upward to there and then, which we know is real and is coming to us, and we are coming to it. So the endurance of hardness that we must deal with, it's, a, it's like a competition. From our perspective, it's a competition where we press in to obtain that, or Brother Paul says, take hold of that for which you were taken hold of. Like an athlete who's gifted, and he's honed and prepared his gifts and talents to be used in a certain way, even so we. God has granted us exceeding great and precious promises and extended uh, other spiritual uh, provision for us, and we then take hold of that and use it for his glory and for his honor. 
striving for masteries, he mentions earlier. More, more of the idea of competition with those who desire to rob us of the things that God intends for us to have. Faith gives us an understanding of these things. See? The scripture gives us an understanding, light, to, to see these things as they really are, even, even as the Savior spoke again and again and again, both to his disciples and to his enemies, giving them light. Can't you, can't you imagine some of the scribes and Pharisees? Where, where did he see that? I read that. I read that my whole life, and I never saw that. Now, of course, most of them didn't agree. They didn't like it. They refused uh, the point that he made, unlike the disciples. They rejoiced in the things that were made known to them, striving for masteries in this competition so that we will be able to put on the whole armor of God, stand in the evil day, and as the hymn writer says, press the battle, lest ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. You see, brethren, we have an enemy against us, pressing ever more against us, and we've got to be pressing forward in these things that God has worked in us. There is none else. There is nothing else. There is no place. No other methodology. Strong faith apprises us of what we need, lest we be deceived. And past weaknesses, or as the scripture says, the sin that so easily besets us, lest it beset us again. See. So we remain alert and confident of God's strength in us. We contend for this faith that was once for all delivered to the saints while we we're in the world. Remembering that in the next world, there'll be no competition there. All we and it will be in accord. Primarily, we will be in accord with it. <laughs> we'll be in accord with it. We also study our, or, I'm sorry, study as a workman, rightly dividing the word. This is a text that Brother Paul uses, uh, which we're very, very familiar with. Right, that is to, we study it as to its truth. Uh, we, we, uh, we affirm its integrity and its competency in us by our yielding ourselves to it. We display, we prove these things. See, this is all part of sanctification now, the light that is in us and all things pertaining to life and godliness, that, that it works in us. The scripture, of course, is a primary tool of God's spirit since he's magnified his word above his name. Here's the full text that you may be thinking of, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And by its, enable it, its enablement, the inner man, for the inner man, we give ourselves to these works of righteousness, which he's prepared in advance for us to do. As a result, then, there's no room for profane babblings. We're too busy. See. What we have is given to these good things. No room for profane babblings. We give no quarter to youthful lusts. The foolish and unlearned questions have no place in the speech or the mind of godly confidence. And we will be stable in the truth and the faith and the hope of God's revelation. Then you will be. You will be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. You see, the faith that he has granted to us as we yield ourselves to it, it works in us. See, faith works by its nature. It works throughout the scripture. It's, it, it's abundantly clear. It's amazingly clear. I, uh, I'm ashamed that I missed it for so many years in my preaching and teaching to where I did not emphasize and focus the nature of faith and its working power in those who yield themselves to it and embrace its full measure, or a fuller measure, I should say. So it's reasonable, brethren, that we yield ourselves, the parts of our body, to God as instruments of righteousness, as Brother Paul says there in Romans chapter 6. The resources of our thoughts, our words, our bodily energy, they belong to him who has purchased us with his own blood. They are not our own, but bought with this price, not silver and not gold, but the life of the captain of our salvation. 
the apostle and high priest of our confession, the author and finisher of our faith. These phrases, which are not my own, you know, these phrases and many more describe our Savior's enormous and essential role to bring us to the Father out of this present dark world. And so the faith that he gives us naturally then yields to and prefers what he loves, what he esteems, what he values and treasures. That's its nature see, that he puts within us and its power that works in the trusting heart. So this is all key in this process of sanctification. We, we simply just yield ourselves to it. Again, we get, we get in the flow. We get in the flow of what God has working, has, has already worked, pardon me, what he's already worked. He who sanctifies us by his own sanctification, remember the Savior's words there in John 17, sanctify myself that they too may be sanctified. See? While he was here on the earth, we know these things from the record, his time here in the body is sanctified. He was sanctified by the sacrifice by which he served God to the uttermost, despite the contradiction of sinners against him. That did not detour him, did not turn him away. His focus and determination to continue to the end of this task that was assigned him of the Father. And so by that then, brethren, we are transformed by his spirit dwelling in us. The spirit brings us these things, brings the things of Jesus to us, and conforms us to those things. Doesn't fit it to us. It's fitting us to it. It's, that's, see, that's contained in this, I like to think of as the Great Commission. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself. <laughs> Take up his cross and follow after him. I think that's a greater commission, by the way which is not a biblical phrase, so we can debate all day about which is a greater, can't we? Doesn't matter if a person goes and preaches whatever message to all the nations and makes them into whatever, if they haven't denied themselves and taken up their cross and followed after him, does it? Doesn't matter one whit if they're not sanctified and a useful vessel. He's not gonna, our, our Savior is not gonna put the message of this truth in them as a container anyway. They won't be able to preach it, they won't know it. And most of us know that, don't we? Because at one time we didn't have it either. We needed these things preached to us. We needed to be confirmed in these things. We needed to be further sanctified. Doesn't mean we never were. Let's see, the, pardon me, this is just a reminder that this is a process, it's an ongoing process, not a one-time event. So this work of sanctification acclimates us to the glory of God's presence. It's a realm where flesh cannot abide. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. He's preparing us for that. Hope that's made known in the gospel. Flesh cannot abide in this place. It cannot inherit these things. It's a place prepared for those who are prepared for that place. And so we give ourselves, yield ourselves to these things. See, therefore, beloved, Brother Peter said, therefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless, that we would then be meet for the master's use. I remember this is only preparation. It's not the end. It's not the goal. We're still in the preparatory stages, even here in these words fit for the master's use. See, you, you get ready, then you're ready to be used, even here in the earth. Then you're ready. Now, the, now the world has a view of this about education, don't they? Or, or athletics, you train, you prepare, then you're ready for the real thing. You get your education, you go through your internship, you get, but then you're ready for the, so it shouldn't be surprising, see. The work that we're doing now is preparatory. On many levels, it's preparatory. Being with the Father, fellowship, full, unhindered, without restriction, 
unrestricted, I should say, fellowship with God. Seeing his face, that's the goal. That's the goal. And this process of sanctification prepares us for that. While we, while we engage in good works here in the earth, taking up our cross, aligning ourselves with these things, taking up our cross and following after the course of our Savior, God working in us and through his people. And the works are not an end in themselves either. They're a demonstration of our involvement and fellowship with God the Father by his Son. These works, these works of course, are not, the, these kinds of works are not the common course of temple-minded men. Not all. They're, they're, they're a world apart. Not just a step above. They're a world apart from the things that the Red Cross or FEMA or AmeriCorps or you fill in the blank. They're a world apart from that. Different motivation. Different power. Different purpose. Although we may be involved in feeding some folks and clothing some folks and housing some folks from time to time. We're feeding and housing some of you this week, aren't we? <laughs> and we've fed and housed others who have needs. But that's not our goal. That's not our purpose. That's not the end of these things. Even as the apostles were not involved, they didn't, they didn't uh, give themselves to the same kind of activities the scribes and the Pharisees were involved in, did they? Or the, or the religious philosophers in Athens? They just put a different name over the door doing the same kind of work, but we just got to give it. Not so. Not so. It's a different purpose. See, temporal religious matters. These are higher things. They may, what, they may be what appears from time to time to be similar acts of goodness and mercy and kindness and generosity, but they're of a higher order, from a higher motivation. The hope and the power that works in us is that which pleases the Father, not that which pleases someone else who's looking or some particular person who has the need. We seek to please the Father. Then you're ready to be entrusted with these things that God entrusts his people with. The riches of his truth that has dimensions of height and depth and length and breadth that are immeasurable in the earth. The power of these things is clear. In statements like this from Brother James, wisdom that is from above, first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace in them who make peace. Now, the world would like to steal a lot of those words. They have their own definitions for them, don't they? And their own purpose for them. But the righteousness that's described here is the righteousness of God. It's not political righteousness. It's not social righteousness. It's not personal righteousness. It's eternal righteousness that we have been called to in this gospel, and we are yielding ourselves to be sanctified to and in by this power. Else we're going to be taken away by worldly wisdom that in truth is just bitter envying and strife, even lying against the truth. Wisdom that is earthly, sensual, and devilish and where you see envying and strife and confusion and every evil work. Look at Washington, D.C. Those are the kinds of things you see there. Not so among God's people. Not so. This is a revealed wisdom, of course, for those who are light and salt, that he's making light and salt. He's made light and salt. And so he's working the nature of light and salt in his people. The strength of his righteousness enables us in these things. As one of you will be dealing with this text, Brother Paul's statement here, but of him ye are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We're made that. These things are granted to us. We're granted light in these things. Wherever we are, whatever we do, with whomever we speak, and however we engage the hour or the day, or the circumstances, we give witness to this righteousness of God as he works these things in us. So these things involve the peace of his goodness, which is a, which is a great profit to us who are part of this peace, this peace which passeth all understanding, this peace that keeps our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, 
the peace of God made and is of eminent value on the last day. You don't want to stand before God and there be any enmity between you and he. You want peace, and his peace is the only peace that will be acceptable in his sight. And it's a revealed peace. It's a peace that he has made known to us, even as our brother Isaiah recognized. You're familiar with these statements. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. See, God works these things in us. Prepared unto every good work. Now, now, we're, re now we're ready. Now we're ready. See, first, uh, not necessarily in this order, but in and as God's field. First, as God's field. He works these things in us, and then we go to work in the field. See, planting. The planting of the Lord, he has made us, bearing fruit unto him. And then we plant, and we cultivate, and, and we water. Of course, it's God that gives the growth, saves and sanctifies the believing soul. In and as God's vineyard, as and in God's vineyard. <laughs> we are his vineyard. He's made us so. We are connected by him to the vine, drawing life from him and then bearing fruit that will last while the Father cultivates and prunes us in his wisdom and for the glory of his name, and then we put our hand to the work as well. And as and in God's orchard, the planting of the Lord, a multiplicity of fruit-bearing trees, as is recorded in the first garden, every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, that's true in us as well and the multiplicity of working that God does in each of us, and then we put our hand to also to do. Those in whom his truth abides and increases and produces that which he desires. We'll be using the plow. We'll be using the pruning hook. And we'll be harvesting using the tools that God gives us. Like our brother John, John the Baptist in the wilderness, preaching the kingdom of God, preparing people for the coming of the Lord, making every hill low, raising up every valley, making the way straight for his coming. First we yield ourselves to him, as Brother John did, and then he puts tools in our hands that we can give ourselves to. We assist one another to engage the good things of God, our own Savior, increasing in wisdom and favor and stature before God and men. For we must first please God, of course, in all of these things. And then also those who believe. And then, as we are able, we have associations with others in godliness and truth. Believers first and also unbelievers, they're welcome to come in. But they'll come in and conform just like we have, just like all do. For God is not fitting himself, the Savior is not fitting himself to the human agenda, whether it be out of Washington or Moscow or Sydney or Tokyo or Buenos Aires or wherever it is. He's not fitting himself to any of those agendas. All will conform to his agenda. All will, believer and unbeliever alike. It just won't, it just won't benefit the unbelievers, see. But our Savior yielded himself to his Father's agenda. Then he went forth in the power of the Spirit, didn't he? And so will we. So will we. In whatever circumstance of life we engage. The twelve who left all to follow him, they refused to forsake him when others did. Will you leave me also? He said, not so, Lord. Not so. To whom should we go? They remained near. They increased in their devotion to him. Brother Thomas said, let us also go that we may die with him. Their devotion to him increased to that point even to that point where Peter said, wrongly he said, but meaning well, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? See, they were willing to yield themselves, put forth their hands in that matter. So let us do the same, brethren. As we speak the truth, we'll have to correct some misconceptions. We'll have to be corrected. Oftentimes, encourage those who believe, 
and those who seek, ask, and knock. They, they ask about the hope that we have within us, because we obviously have a different hope, see. Like Brother Stephen, who stood and spoke without fear in the lion's den. He would not seek to protect himself. He fearlessly declared this truth of God's testimony throughout the ages, even the testimony of his Savior and ours as well. He yielded himself fully to their hatred in like manner to his master. And he was rewarded with a sight that few in the earth have ever seen, none that we know of in the scripture record. He was able to see, even in the body, sustained his heart to confront then the last enemy. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, he said. And he was received. God will receive us as well and enable us to press forward in the fray of hostility against the truth, which that fray becomes more obvious every day, doesn't it? The fray against the truth, yeah. Philip, who launched out from Jerusalem, our brother Philip had a, you might say, a, a, an easier course in some sense. First recognized by the brethren around him as one who's full of the Spirit, able to handle these things, entrusted with the resources of feeding the sisters. He, he launched out from there and uh, for care for the widows to a public ministry, uh, a preaching and teaching in Samaria, and then to that Ethiopian nobleman, his ministry extended even to Caesarea, where he and his wife raised four daughters who were prophetesses. It's the last record that we have of Brother Philip. Different kind of record than Brother Stephen. And finally, of course, Brother Paul, the great master builder. What things were gained to me, I can't have lost for Christ. Enabled him to do that. He, he was the only one who was sent to the Gentile world, and of course his words, as I said at the beginning, are the primary source texts for our whole meeting this week. That I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Such is the gospel, the gospel of our redemption that makes us a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. So brethren, by God's grace, I commend you to these words. The Lord make you increase and abound in love one toward another, toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. God's grace and peace, brother. Amen.